opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of ONTD's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick, and across from me, Malik Hill. And uh, things are, you know, fine. Nothing too crazy right now. We got the NBA Finals going on. Um, but other than that, sports world is kind of quiet at the moment, which is weird. Um, unless you're watching the Stanley Cup Finals, I guess. Um, but I haven't really paid close attention to them. I know that. Florida was up and looking good, but who knows? And then the Tigers, they are within two games of, you know, a uh, wild card race. I can't remember. Tarek Skubal is up for consideration for the Cy Young, which is cool. Um, so, again, maybe we'll talk about the Tigers, but maybe we don't want to jinx things. Um, Tork got sent down to the Mud Hens. Yeah, Spencer Torkelson. That's eh. he's doing great there, but he can't hit big league pitches. So no, yeah, um, what do you say? And Javi Baez is still a tiger. So yeah, yeah. good job, guys. Yeah, good job. Um, in the world of basketball, though, we lost an icon, a logo per se. Yes. Um, Jerry West has passed away. At was is he eighty six? Did I see? I didn't. I, I don't know the exact age. Okay. Um, but he's pretty, passed he was away. In his 80s. You know, one of the, the phenoms of the 50s play or the 60s or whatever. Well, he played until the early 70s. That's when yeah. he retired in like 72. And he played a long time, won some championships. Um, won one championship. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I saw like several tweets this morning. That's why um, I've. No, I can list off a few of his. Uh, do I still have a saved? I don't have a saved. He was a twelve-time All Star. He was like four, fourteen-time All NBA, five-time All Defense, which a lot of people don't know how underrated he was for being a defender. Mm-hmm. One-time champion because he lost to the Celtics, I believe, seven times. Yeah, that's yeah. an unfortunate time. Oh, Bill, yeah, Bill Russell and those guys just kept beating him over and over again. One time, he's the only player to win. A finals MVP on the losing team. Wow. Okay. He also did that, and I believe it was against the Celtics. Interesting. So, yeah, he was one of, like, the first, if if you could consider it, modern-day pull-up shooters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, if you watch highlights of him, like, the way he dribbles, like, steps into his jumper is very modern. His jumper was pure, one of the best forms of his era. And he described himself. He said he wasn't a dog. He was a wolf. Which is all time stuff. You deserve to be the logo if you say something like that. Interesting. Yeah. And he was the logo. Yeah. And probably will be most likely forever unless something crazy happens. Yeah. Also one of the greatest executives in NBA history, which Yeah. Yeah, like eight titles as an executive, drafted Kobe, traded for Shaq, and it goes on and on. Yeah. His basketball of his mind was out of this world. Playing career. Yeah. He was quite successful, that's for sure. Um, so an unfortunate loss in the basketball community. Um, as we stay on the topic of the Lakers, they reached out to uh, Coach Hurley at UConn. Uh, Things were to, heating up. Trying to pull him away from college basketball. Yeah. Lakers fans were getting excited. and Danny Hurley was, was coming down to a decision. Mm-hmm. He wasn't telling anybody. And boy, the things people were, people were so excited. Yep. Danny Hurley was going to be there for a decade. They were going to win some more championships. LeBron was going to go out on top, Joey. Yep. AD was going to hit his yeah. where he's supposed to be, that ceiling. Mm-hmm. All that was going to happen. And it all crumbled away <laughs> because yeah. Dan Hurley decided not to go to the Lakers. Yeah, he, uh, he looked at what he was building, what he has built, 
and said, um, I'd rather go for a three-peat yeah. than take the blame for what's most likely can't be fixed. Yeah. And, I mean, it goes to show, too, like, you know, he's he's an East Coaster, you know, originally. Yeah. So Him and his, his whole family. Right. So, like, it's still kind of an important thing out there, whereas, you know, most of the basketball community, a lot of the – I don't know how to word it. I don't want to make anybody mad. Um, but, you know, I'm not even sure what you were about to say. The fake fans of basketball. Oh, forget those just, people. Call them just, out. That just love the Lakers. Um, Please, always think. Out. Listen, Yankees fans, Lakers fans, yeah. Cowboys fans. Always think, how can you turn down this storied franchise? And they're still saying it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, they won a championship in the bubble, which I so, don't know listen, how to Some people frame say it. it's one of the hardest rings. Some people say it's one of the easiest yeah. rings. There's not much middle ground. Yeah, it's still a championship, so I'm not going to like take it away from them. Other than that, they won back when Kobe was around. So like, and then before that was the 2000s. So it's like every decade they have a little run. Um, so I like they're a storied franchise, but at the same time they've had some really low times. Um, so it's not always like everybody's just going to be. Oh, the Lakers have called. I'm going. Listen, that that that's that's one of my biggest problems, man. Let me ask you a question. Okay. Who who's the Lakers coach when they won that ring in the bubble? Do you uh, remember? I don't know. <laughs> you don't even remember. No, I don't. That's the funny part. I don't keep pay attention. To Their them. coach was Frank Vogel. Yeah, and then they fired him. Uh yes. Yeah. Shortly after. Yep. Um I haven't seen any Lakers fans give Frank Vogel credit for anything. No. After he won that title. I've seen a few people saying we should have stuck with Frank Vogel. Mm-hmm. But they weren't saying that after they won a title. Yeah. And then the organization kind of messed up the roster, and he didn't just lift them up, and they were like, get Frank out of here. Right. Lakers fans don't care about Frank Vogel. Mm-hmm. He helped them win a title, and it still means nothing. Yeah. Why would Danny Hurley leave UConn? Where he's he's a god now. Mm-hmm. He has won two in a row at what is basically like a new blue blood in, in UConn mm-hmm. and is going for a third Yeah, and has a good chance of doing it. I, I don't know why he would go to the Lakers. Well, the biggest part, too, apparently the Lakers lowballed him. Apparently they offered him somewhere of like, I don't know. 10. I'm pretty sure the deal was $70 million. Yeah, and it was somewhere around like six years or something. Yeah. Um, which really isn't that crazy, um, especially coming for the Lakers that were so desperate to have him. Um, so I think that was in part of it, part of it as well. Uh, so I'm just glad that somebody turned on the Lakers for once. Makes me feel good inside. Yeah. It was also, I saw a few old Lakers players like Danny Hurley. I'm sure he's happy. He went back to UConn. But turning down the purple and gold, like that's, I, I yeah. hate it. I hate it so much. <laughs> yeah. Of cool, you have history mm-hmm. and you have championships and you have great players. Yeah. But whether it's them or the Cowboys or the Yankees or whoever else, that, that mentality yeah. of how dare you turn us down or how dare you not come here, mm-hmm. we're supposed to win. Yeah. We're just, even if we don't win a championship, we're champions. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, Dallas Cowboys haven't made a conference championship since the 90s. Yeah. Yeah, Yankees, who have been overrated for over a decade now. Mm -hmm. And yes, Los Angeles Lakers, who I hope continue to crash and burn. Yeah. It would be, wouldn't it be great if LeBron just left? It would be. (laughs) Just left him at the altar this summer. Yeah. And then Lakers fans turned on him. And we have to see LeBron fans versus Lakers fans. I would love it if. Oh my this God. is obviously not going to happen. That, that, it'd be the best basketball summer of all time. But I would love it if, like, somebody like Utah takes Bronny. And LeBron's like, you know what? <laughs> Screw it. I'm going to Utah. <laughs> Leaves the Lakers oh for the Utah God. Jazz. Could you imagine? That'd be amazing. That, that would be hilarious. I know it's not happening, but. I would cheer it on. It'd be amazing. Let's, let's go Jazz. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. That's the only other news that we have. Um, so we'll get into the NBA Finals. Um, so far, not so great. But, you know, it's two Celtic home games, two Celtic victories pretty easily. Um, not considered blowouts, I would say, but 
pretty pretty easy wins. Um, what do you have to take away from these first two games? And do you think the Mavericks are going to get it back? They, they play tonight, right, um, in Dallas. So, yeah, what are your thoughts so uh, far? I, I do expect Dallas to get back in it. I don't know if they'll win two straight and tie the series, but mm-hmm. – the biggest factor to start this series is gone. Yeah. And that's huge. Kristaps Porzingis returned in this series in game one. Came out on fire. Barely missed a shot. Mm-hmm. Was huge on defense and on the boards. They just put it on Dallas in game. Now, they tried to come back in the third. Luka gave it everything he had in game one and game two. Yep. Not on both ends of the court, but on offense for the most part. Right. And... Yeah, having that having Porzingis on the floor, even if he's not scoring nonstop, he is such an effect on both ends of the court. You have to take note of him on offense because he if you let him get any space, he can shoot it over you. And on defense, going to the paint is ten times harder because he can swat it away with ease. Mm-hmm. And I I'm not gonna go in super hard on Jason Tatum. He's been a good playmaker and a good defender, but his scoring has been terrible. Mm-hmm. Jalen Brown has played well. Drew Holiday and Derek White have played well. Everybody's done their part for the Celtics. Dallas, I, I almost think this is this is a new series for them after this. Mm-hmm. Those first two games, Kyrie playing horrible, he has to show up. Yeah. But you can forget about those two first two games of Kyrie playing bad. Derek Lively looking like a, a a rookie again, and just not being comfortable at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're just not being good on either side of the ball, really. Yeah. Porzingis being hurt, you got to play Luke Cornett more. I don't know how much of an effect <laughs> Luke Cornett is going to make. Yeah. And you got to depend a lot on Uncle Al. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a lot of old big man minutes. Even though he's in great shape and he's still playing well, that's a lot of Al Horford minutes. Yeah. Which means you do you have Jason Tatum try to defend the paint more? I don't mm-hmm. know if you want to do that. They're going back to Dallas for two games. If Luka and Kyrie are on point, it's going to be hard, really hard for Boston to gain rhythm because I do not trust Jason Tatum right now to just like go off yeah. and win them a game. I don't trust it. Boston has to continue to play great team basketball, and they've done it. They've done it all year. Right. But in these types of series where Luka and Kyrie could both go off in, in these back-to-back games and tie the series, mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm not giving Jason Tatum any excuses. You got to go 30-plus. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm tired of you just chucking contested threes, and sometimes you just get to the rim and score easily, and other times you just won't get to the rim and score. Yeah. I, I hate it. I hate every part of it. Mm-hmm. It, it annoys me. And, or it seems oh. like sometimes he gets to the rim and he just kind of throws it at the basket. Well, he is he's 6'10". Yeah. And not like an elite athlete, but an NBA-level athlete at 6'10", and he's put on a bunch of muscle. He's over 230 pretty much, yeah. or just around 230. Dunk on somebody. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't get it, Joey. <laughs> yeah. Like, Jalen Brown is never hesitant to be aggressive and take off on somebody. Mm-hmm. And he's almost more valuable than Jason Tatum at this point because of that. I'd say he is. Like it, it is. It blows my mind that he just won't. Those, those are momentum changing plays. Mm-hmm. When you like show everybody you're one of the best players in the league, and make one of those plays where the crowd is just like, oh, like when Anthony Edwards took off and dunked on. I can't remember who it was in that last series. Everybody was just like, oh, man. And the momentum kind of shifted. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that was the game Minnesota won. Or was that the closeout game? I can't remember which game I'm it was. I'm not sure either. But the, the energy of the whole arena changed when Anthony Edwards dunked it like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I I need Jason Tatum to do something. Yeah. Something in the scoring department. Mm-hmm. And I will say, for the fact of Kyrie, the Mavericks need to figure out a way to get him open. I think without the ball, because whenever he has the ball, Drew Holiday, Derek White are just smothering him. And I mean, JJ Redick and Doris Burke are saying that it was are the best, like that's the best defensive backcourt of all time. Now that's a bold statement. It is. It's a bold statement. But and and 
terms of today's game, there's not much better you can get. Yeah, and than there's Derek White and Drew Holiday. There's probably some real to that, but that that's a tough topic because we'd have to really dive deep for that kind of yeah. thing. But it just tells you how good they are defensively. And Kyrie, you know, he's still very athletic, but he he is starting to age. Um, and Drew Holiday is also, you know, aging as well. But he's more of just a defensive player. He doesn't have to play on the offensive side as much or do he, as much he's offensively. Hitting open threes for the most part. Yeah. Whereas Kyrie is open. Kyrie has to somewhat hang with those guys. He's not the greatest defender. But then he has he's, to go. He's played much better defense in these playoffs. Yeah. But, yeah. but then he has to put all of his effort into his offense, and those guys are just tearing him apart right now. So I think the Mavericks need to figure out a way to get him off the ball, rolling off screens or something, because he can play that way too. Like he can shoot off of off of screens and things like that, and that might just be the way to open him up. They got to they got to figure something out to manufacture him good looks, because him just dribbling around like you know he used to be able to. He's not getting that separation that he can. I think them going back home, I think, will change things. Mm -hmm. Even though Drew Holiday and Derek White have a ton of experience. Yeah. Kyrie has been in this situation, too. He's had ups and downs in terms of, like, scoring. So, I expect him to bounce back. I'd be shocked if he had another horrible game. Mm -hmm. His game is based off of having the ball in his hands and making things happen. So, we'll see. But I have confidence Kyrie will bounce back. Yeah. Um, do you have any adjustments to how long do you think the series will go? Do you think it's still the same? Or I'm going Celtics in six. Okay. I think that was my prediction from the jump. I think so, too. But even with Porzingis out, I think their game plan so far is so well as like a collective mm-hmm. that just Luka and Kyrie going off, it'll be tough to win a series Yeah, with just that winning four games. Mm-hmm. They could pull out two. I don't, I don't know if they can win four. Yeah. I'm starting to think it might be Celtics in five, unfortunately. It's, it's possible. It I, possible. I just, I'm starting to get that feeling. And maybe it's just, you know, recency bias of just getting the two uh, Boston games. But hopefully Dallas can bounce back and pick up these two home games. But, man, if if the Celtics get, like, tonight's game and then the Mavericks win uh, the second one at home, I could see that happening. And then you go back to Boston and then it's over. Um, I hope it's not. I hope it goes extended, but it just seems like this might just be Boston's year, and they just might run away with it, unfortunately. Um, all right. Anything else you need to add or be good? Uh I don't think so. All right. Yeah. Um, again, because we're getting into the summer episodes with uh not as much news and notes, we're gonna start doing our top tens. Um we have some Ideas planned out for a couple times. And then again, we're still trying to figure out this Pistons episode that we're going to do at some point. So this week, not really in light of anything, but it just so happens that Luka is in the NBA Finals. Porzingis was playing too. True. That's yeah. that's a good point. Um, we are going to do our top 10 favorite international players. Now. You're doing 10? Yeah. <laughs> if, you want to do five. if you want to do five, we can do yeah, five. I got, I got some honorables that will extend it to okay. eight. I just figured, I can think of a few more, but I just, I've, I've got a top five list and okay. some honorables. I just figure we have the time. I'll go through some of mine real quick, okay. and I'll treat them almost as an honorable. So, um, Yeah, if you want to start off, who's the uh, first guy that you want to mention? So I this this is like one of the only guys playing today that I would list. It's not Luka. I love watching Luka play, but mm-hmm. – I wouldn't list him as like a favorite player of mine. That yeah. would go to like Anthony Edwards, and um, I don't know. I'm forgetting who else, but this is a guy that I had stock in coming out of the draft. A lot of people had doubts in him. Most people had doubts in him. Honestly, Knicks fans were extremely angry when he got drafted. Michael Rappaport called him Tingus Pingus. <laughs> they booed him. They booed. A little kid cried when they panned to him in the crowd. Mm-hmm. Everybody was just sad and angry and tired of the Knicks when yeah. they picked Chris Das Porzingis in 2017. Or was it, was it 2015? I think it was 2015, right? Has he been in the league nine years? He, he can't have been in the league nine years. He's been in the league a while. Oh, my but God, was it 2015? But I'll look it up. But, yeah, the point is Knicks fans weren't happy. 
NBA media wasn't happy. They wanted them to – a lot of people wanted them to take Justice Winslow, which is the funny part. Mm -hmm. He didn't pan out at all. And I saw highlights of him overseas. And even though he was extremely skinny, barely 200 pounds. 2015. Jeez, that's crazy. Because he's 28. But I think his height and the way he moved and his skill set was different. Mm -hmm. Like, I saw him running the floor almost like a small, a small forward or a guard. He had, like, alien athleticism for being 7'3". Like, yeah. jumping up and, like, jump dunk, dunking on people and catching lobs. And then his shooting stroke was so smooth. Mm -hmm. Everything he did at his size was smooth. And before putting on weight and all that stuff, it just seemed like he had a natural feel for the game. And a lot of people doubted him. I believed in Chris House Porzingis. He had a surprisingly good rookie season to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Somewhat of a sophomore slump. And then if he didn't get hurt in his third year, he would have made the all-star team. Yeah. He came on in a huge way. He was averaging like 23 and 10, I believe. He was playing great. He got traded to Dallas and had some downs. He was still immature and didn't fit with Luka. Mm -hmm. Kind of showed he could still be really good in Washington when nobody cared last year. And now on this Boston team this year, he averaged like 20 and 8 as the third guy and was like the X factor on their team all season. 64 win team. I just I've I've been a fan of Porzingis since the beginning, and shouts out to Chris S. Porzingis. Yeah, um, I'll just I'll just tell you since he's on my back half of my list, he's at my number one or <laughs> he's at my number nine for my top ten, um, and I agree with basically everything you said. I just loved, of course, me being a shooter, I loved guys that could shoot, especially being a seven three guy that could shoot like that. And like you said, be able to move and play defensively as well. Yeah. Like he's not just a one way player. Um, he's kind of, I think the other thing that I like about him, he's like what Darko was advertised to be. That is, that is depressing, but true. <laughs> Everything Porzingis is, is what Joe yeah. Dumars saw. Right. And what whoever else was with him at that workout saw. Yeah. They said Darko barely missed a three. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember what ESPN scout it was. But he, he he went on Bill Simmons' podcast and told the story of, like, that day. Yeah. And said it was, like, one of the most flawless workouts they'd ever seen. Right. And he, he didn't miss a three. He dunked everything, and he looked in incredible. And the wild thing is Kristaps is bigger. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, if you're watching Kristaps during the finals, they had – he was standing next to Derek Lively, I think, at the free throw line, and Derek Lively is seven foot. And Porzingis just looks almost like seven four yeah. in that position. They have him listed as seven three most of the time. Um, it's just wild that a guy like that can can do that kind of thing. So, yeah, he's on my on my list as well. He was at my number nine. Um, the honorable mention that I wanted to bring up was a uh, he's honorable mention because he played for the Pistons. He was fun to watch, role player. You know, didn't get a lot of shine. The reason he's off the list completely and he's an honorable mention is because he also hurt USA basketball. I'm talking Carlos Arroyo? about none other than Carlos Arroyo. The Puerto Rican handle goat. Yeah. That man, he, he could do some crazy stuff with the basketball. Yeah. And unfortunately, he never got to shine with the Pistons because they were a powerhouse at the yeah. time. But, you know, he got his minutes here and there, and he, he played pretty good. Um, But, yeah, in, in those Olympics, basically the reason USA basketball had to make the redeem team. Listen. They, they, everybody says when team, when guys play for their home country, mm -hmm. that's when they become the superstar. And Carlos Arroyo, he became yeah. like a mix between Magic Johnson and <laughs> like John Stott. He was every great point guard mixed in one yeah. in the 04 Olympics. Mm -hmm. it, it was insane to watch. Right. Um, not much else to say besides that, but that's why I figured he'd be an honorable mention. Who you got next? Uh, next honorable mention. I know he's going to be higher on your list, but he's not in my top five. Now, if we if we didn't went outside of favorites and just said top international players, mm -hmm. he'd be in my top three easily. But he's on my honorable honorables list, Dirk. I mean, I in my opinion, and a lot of basketball fans seem to think now he has the heaviest ring in NBA history. Mm -hmm. What he did in 2011, beating like the last uh, inch of superstar Brandon. Uh, Brandon Roy and LaMarcus Aldridge. Mm -hmm. He beat the last light of Kobe as a superstar. 
He beat OKC before they made the finals, mm-hmm. and then he beat the Heels. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a run. And he, and he put the scoring load on his back every single series, mm-hmm. and went crazy whenever he had to. Yeah, I mean, just off of that, I mean, we're not, we're not even talking about the young Dirk that could run and dunk. Yeah, and do everything. Mm-hmm. But he he turned into a different monster later in his career, and yeah, he he deserves all the respect in the world for that. Yeah, and he was able to evolve his game as he aged too. Yeah pretty well um which is exciting yeah i'll, I'll talk about talk about him later mm-hmm. um so technically my number 10 um is actually mark gasol i like it uh it was kind of surprising like to me when i started looking at my list of guys that i written down wrote down and i always you know again hating the lakers i could never like the thing that stunk was i really liked Pau gasol when he was on the grizzlies um, and so like growing up, I was a big fan of Pau Gasol. I was also in the boat where I thought his name was Paul, um, but it's not, <laughs> it's Pau. Um, and I learned that growing up, but as soon as he went to the Lakers, I couldn't like him anymore. I just, I couldn't do it, especially as a younger kid. Uh, uh, it was like, it's like what happened to a lot of my favorite players. You know, they go to teams that I hate. We had, um, Pau Gasol go to the Lakers. Ray Allen, Kevin Garnett going to the Celtics, all just dream crushers for a young Joey. Um, so what's the next best thing to do? Just flip to his twin brother. Um, now, he also played for the Lakers at one point, but uh, that was a limited stint, and most of his time was with the Grizzlies, and that Grizzlies team was just fun to watch with Mike Conley, Zach Randolph, Tony Allen. Like They were just a gritty, grindy team. And then as Marcus Hall got older, he, you know, started shooting more and more threes and he could just do a lot of different things. And he wasn't like the most athletic guy out there, but he was, you know, always up there in shot blocking, one of the better defenders in the league at the time. Um, multiple time, multiple time all-star. Um, and yeah, I just think sometimes with being Powell's brother, he got overlooked at times, but yeah, he's my number 10. Nice. So I have two more honorables left. Okay. I think this is the only time we've done a list where I'm picking like a very small, specific window for a a certain player. I like that though. That's my kind of that's my kind of guy. I'm going with old, somewhat overweight Boris Diaw in San Antonio. (laughs) I knew he would be on your list. I had a feeling. Young Boris Diaw is kind of like a. It's like a myth. I've I've heard so many players in interviews say that like Boris had like a over forty inch vertical. Mm-hmm. He could dunk on anybody. He had deep three point range. He could do everything. Mm-hmm. But they made him a role player in Phoenix. Like he, he was almost like a myth of like a French player. Mm-hmm. This version of Boris Diaw, it was, it was at a point where I could finally appreciate the Spurs, because when I was younger, I hate I hated the way they I hated the way they played, but I loved the Pistons. It's so ironic. But they were the hometown t- hometown team, and the personalities were just so much better. You had Sheed and Ben and all different types of personalities. Yeah. But seeing Boris Diaw at like 6'10", I'm, I guarantee he was over 260 because he never looked like he was in incredible shape in that like three-year span on the Spurs. But his IQ was off the charts. He seemed It seemed like he hit every open three that he had. He could always score in the paint, but he could never really jump. Like, <laughs> sorry. He had like that old man community center game. Yeah. Where nobody could really stop him. Mm-hmm. These like no look, but like back passes going to the rim. Anything he wanted to do on the court in that San Antonio system, Boris could do it. Yeah. And it was almost like an actualization of the myth mm-hmm. of Boris Dia. Like the athleticism went away. All the superstar stuff, ability that he had went away. Yeah. But he still was an incredible basketball player yeah. for the Spurs and gave them everything they needed coming off the bench. Right. I was going to say he he's, he's still productive enough to get things done for them. Yeah. And every time they needed something, he got it done. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I love those types of players. Yeah. Where when all the other th- stuff falls apart, what do you still have? Mm-hmm. And he, he was a high-level, older role player. Yeah, that still had a ton of skill. I'm glad you mentioned that. Be, mentioned him because that's a list that I want to do in the future of guys that aged 
well. Age gracefully. Oh, I, I like that. Yeah, we because got one of those lists. and it's one of those episodes where it it kind of spins into players that had a past that kids nowadays don't know about. Basically, yeah. um, so I wrote it down to remember because that that's a list that I think could be fun because there's there's a few of them in mind that I have that we could talk about. All right, um, my number eight, which would be on my top ten, another piston. Again, a short career with the Pistons, unfortunately. But luckily, that wasn't the end of his career. He went on. Uh, I think he made a couple All Star teams. I know who you're talking about. And I know who it is. <laughs> it's another big man that could shoot. Yes. And I mean, he was one of the few stretch fives at that time. Yes. And he was great off the bench for that championship roster. Talking nobody, uh, Mehmet Okor. The man, Mehmet Okor. Yeah. Yes. He was so ahead of his time and you can say that about a lot of guys here and yeah. there but the way that he would just leak out to the corner pull up shoot threes make shots and then when he when he left the pistons and he went to the jazz and he, he got, got an even better bigger role yeah. he got better and then you saw like everything that he could do um because at first like when he played with the pistons you're like oh yeah he's a great role player he can you know hit some spot up shots but when he was with the jazz he was like he was their number two guy, basically. Well, it, it was it was uh, it was really Darren Williams and Carlos Boozer, but that's true. Boozer was on that team. Yeah, but Mehmet Okor was dependent was, on. Yeah, he was the best three point shooter in the starting five. Yeah, basically. <laughs> so, um, just the way that I love the kind of underrated guys. Yeah. Um, so to see what he was able to do just beyond the Pistons and be able to watch his career um, grow was was pretty awesome. That. You know, even though he was with the Pistons for only a couple of years, that once he left, he grew his game even more. And I think he's a, he's one of those underappreciated uh, stars, pseudo stars at the time. So Mehmet would be my nice number pick. Eight. So my last honorable. Mm-hmm. This is a blast from the past. The one player from before the 2000s or 2010s on my list. Wow. I a guy that I didn't find out about probably until like high school, really. Mm -hmm. As I just kept learning about basketball, playing NBA 2K, watching old highlights. Yep. I came across this guy who was kind of, I, I wouldn't say a basketball prodigy, but he came up in the era of like the mid to late 80s of international basketball players. Some of them stayed overseas. Some of them came to the league. He was one of the few that was like really turning into a star in the early nineties. Mm -hmm. Drazen Petrovic. I'm glad you brought him up because I he was basically going to be on my honorable mention, but I didn't want to get too far in the this weeds. dude. He was like, I don't even know who I compare him to. I, I don't know if I'd say Clay. He it's was kind of like a European Clay because if he got his shot off. Mm -hmm. Uh, you were terrified every time he got a good look. Yeah. Because his form was close to perfect, and it went in most of the time. Yeah. He put up 40 on some of the greats. He put 40 on Jordan. Yeah. He wasn't afraid of anybody. Playing for the New Jersey Nets before they kind of took off in, like, the late 90s and early 2000s. Right. Him, Kenny Anderson, Derek Coleman, mm -hmm. they had that short little era where people thought they were going to take off. But Drazen tragically passed right after a few years with the Nets, so it never fully took off. Yeah, but Drazen, he he was one of the few Europeans of the early '90s that was a true dog. Yeah, and I would say that's one of the early indications showing at how good the international players were at yeah. shooting. Exactly, because that became started the becoming the stuff. thing: dribble, pass, shoot. International players could shoot really well. And that's where we started seeing that kind of thing. And it's kind of stayed true to this day. Yeah. Like Sabonis didn't come over. He stayed overseas. Yeah. The Have you ever heard of Oscar Schmidt, the German guy that put out? You, you should look him up. No. I think he, he um the last U.S. team that was still college guys, mm -hmm. Oscar Schmidt put them out and scored like 40-something. He was like a great Euro guy. I think he was from Germany. Yeah. He was a like crazy scorer. There were several guys. Oscar Schmidt got drafted, didn't come over. Hmm. Drazen, like I said, Drazen was one of the few at a young age that came over. Yeah. Started with the Trailblazers, went to the Nets, and was, yeah, just a high-level guy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, shouts out to Drazen Petrovic. 
All right, my next guy on my list, one of the greatest nicknames of all time. And he's he's another underrated all-star, I would say. Not so not as underrated as like Mehmet Okur, but one of the greatest do a little bit of everything players, in my opinion, ever. I'm talking about AK forty seven. Hey, man. Andre Listen, Karolinko. The kids don't know, Joey. They don't know. And if you told them, I think they still wouldn't understand. No, they wouldn't. Because all they want is somebody that averages like 25 plus a game. Yeah. But they I, do not understand the value. But what if I told you I could give you somebody that could average 15, 5, 5, 5, 2, yes. 2, <laughs> And in his best season, average like 17, 8, and 8. Yeah. And be locked down and give you offense when you need it. Yeah. Andre Kirilenko. Yeah. Go on. One of the funny enough, he has a great all around career. One of the worst all time career haircuts. Hey, l- listen, man. <laughs> he was a Russian kid yeah. in the nineties. Well, right. I, it's not much you could expect. No, I know. He had just, the Drago cut. Yeah, but <laughs> it's just funny. Um, he was able to shoot pretty decently. He had a mid range game, evolved a little bit into a three point game um, later in his career. But again, like. He was just super good on the defensive he end. He was a menace. That's yeah. what he knew. That that's what he was known for. Six nine, long, and long arms. I was just about to say he was like kind of like a European Tayshawn. Yeah, yeah, that's a good <laughs> yeah. comparison. Um, he bothered a lot of people. That's when that Jazz team was really good. Yeah, and that's another team that people thought, can this Jazz team ever get over the hump? Never quite did. In my opinion, almost the most underrated team of the two thousands. Yeah, probably because they they put a lot of good teams out of the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, he he was just fun to watch because, again, and maybe it's the time, you know, thinking about it now, maybe it's because I was into that, you know, the Pistons era of defense that that's where I started watching defensive guys and enjoying defensive guys. But, like, he would get blocks. He would pick pocket guys. He was one of the early guys to be able to guard one through five. Yeah. Which, you know, nowadays you have to be, but he would he would thrive in this era. I think because I think he would shoot even more threes and I think he would evolve his game pretty well into this era. So Andre Karolinko. That's a great pick. A really good one. Thank you. So I'm starting at my five. Okay. This dude didn't make an all-star team. <laughs> this dude never averaged close to 20 points a game. This is my kind of but guy. Listen, he, he had, he, he started as a piston and as his journey went through the league, he just seemed to like make impacts on every team he was on. Yes. And man, I know, I know what you're talking about. This dude, Carlos Delfino. <laughs> Carlos Delfino. <laughs> the first time I ever saw him, I was watching a Pistons game and he dunked on somebody mm-hmm. wearing number 20. And I was like, who who the hell is this dude? And it was Delfino on the back that 20. His game was just smooth. Yeah. He never got the chance to like be a number 2 guy even. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. But whenever he got on a streak, it's like he he couldn't be stopped. Yeah, like his jumper was smooth. He could he could make moves on some of the best players in the league. Yeah, and get buckets. He had some good years with the Raptors. Yeah, and with the Rockets. Yes, the it, the like early James Harden, Chandler Parsons. Mm-hmm. He had some moments with them. Like he dunked on Kevin Durant a few times. Yeah, he had some big threes for them. I always just loved the way he played. And how his game looked kind of effortless. Yeah. So I, I was I was always a guy that rooted for Carlos Delfino. Hmm. So that's my number five. Nice. Um, just Argentina so I, won the 04 Olympics. Yeah. He was on the, the team that won. Him and Luis Scola. Yeah. Wild. Um, just so I can catch up, I'll do my six and seven together. Uh, they both kind of had a similar-esque vibe, I guess. Um, my first one, though, is another player that, he didn't really age as well, but he aged okay. But in his early days, he could get up. He was he was pretty athletic. Um, injuries kind of slowed him down throughout his career. Um, but he had a good career with the New York Knicks for a while, and that's Danilo Gallinari. Uh, Talk I, about one of the most underrated players of our time. Yeah. He averaged 20 for like six years. And nobody knew about it, really, because <laughs> he played for the Knicks yeah. when they were terrible, unfortunately. Um, another one of those stretch bigs early on, kind of before his time. Um, and again, he was athletic enough to be able to dunk on people. Um, kind of that, 
six nine, six ten. Yeah, he was right around there. But he had like some thickness to him as well. So he's like this weird tweener player at the time that I don't think I ever did, anybody fully knew how to get the max potential out of him at the time. Um, I, the the fact that the Knicks messed that up with him and David Lee and Nate Robinson shows yeah. how much of a mess they were at the time. Yeah, because they hit on all three of those guys. Mm -hmm. And still just couldn't figure it out. David Lee, another favorite player of yeah. mine. Um, but yeah, I loved those. It's it's wild that I used to like those Knicks teams. I don't I mean, know they were they were fun. I don't know when I became like a Knicks fan. That was like oh seven. But oh seven, oh eight. Yeah. Like I all of a sudden I started liking the Knicks teams. Um and so I got to see a lot of Danilo and I don't know, he's just a fun player to watch. Um my other pick, similar vein, but he's aged pretty well throughout his career. Started with the Magic, bounced around. Well, did he start with the Lakers? I can't now remember. I'm all now I'm wondering who you're anyway, talking about. Anyway, Nikola Vucevic is my uh, number five. Vuce. Did he start with the Lakers or did he? He started with the Magic. Yeah. yeah. That's who he was with to start. I just had some weird. He got I, bounced around a little bit. I believe bit. he was like a 2011 draft pick. Yeah. Yeah. And he was there until, what, 2018? Something he was like there that. for like seven, eight years. Yeah. But anyway, he was known as like the high level big mm -hmm. that nobody paid attention to for the first. Well, yeah, because yeah, he was basically replacing Dwight Howard. That was like right after the Dwight yeah. Howard stuff. Um, so he was the next big guy in there and he kind of took over as the lead guy for their team, unfortunately. Um, and their team progressively got worse. So he had played on a lot of bad magic yeah. teams. But he, he eventually made the playoffs yeah. once. Yeah. He's once with the magic. But what I liked about him is, you know, he's a, a pretty post up player, um, back to the basket kind of guy. But as he's aged, he's done what a lot of guys do and slowly step out to the three point line. Yeah. Now he shoots a lot of threes. Um, and I just for some reason I like his game. I was it's a big fan of his in nice Orlando. And now that he's in Chicago and the light like came on him more, yeah. It seems like his luster kind of faded some. Yeah. That comes with the age also, but yeah. But Young Vooch, he he was a problem. Yeah, out but there. he he puts up tons of double doubles still, and yeah. he's a productive player for whoever he plays. But he's my number five. My number four, another player in a specific time of his career, because he had some controversial things happen after this stretch, and he really didn't get a shot before this stretch. Mm -hmm. I'm going Orlando Hito Turkoglu. There we go. Figured this is this is like oh seven to like twenty eleven. Mm -hmm. I actually like 07 and 2010 because they brought in Vince Carter the next year. Yeah. That three-year stretch in Orlando, a four-year stretch, whatever, he was he was kind of like a like 2000s Tony, Tony Kukoc. Yeah. And he got even more opportunities. I'm pretty sure Tony Kukoc could have averaged the same numbers he did if he got the same opportunities as like the number two or one guy. Yeah. But in Orlando for those three years, which they got better every year and eventually made the finals, mm -hmm. he was averaging like 20, maybe like eight rebounds and like five assists. Yeah. Like, he Hito Turkoglu was that level of guy where if you need – he was almost 6'10". If you need him to play make, he'll do it. Mm -hmm. If you need him to score in the post, he can do it. Yeah. If, you, if you need him to go out and hit threes, he could definitely do that. Everything you needed to get on offense – Hito Turkoglu could do it. Yeah. And along with, like, Jameer Nelson was kind of like the glue at point guard. Mm -hmm. You had him. You had Rashard Lewis, who was, like, the main three-point shooter. And you had Big Dwight in the post. Yeah. And the more they put pieces together, within a few years, they made that magical finals run. Right. Where they beat LeBron, where everybody wanted it to be Bron versus Kobe. But the Magic took him out. Yeah. And Hito Turkoglu was a big reason why it happened. He was clutch. He he always played big in the playoffs, and I I just loved his style of play. Yeah, I really did. I like that. I was never a big fan of him. For some reason, he just gave me weird vibes. I don't know. <laughs> um, so it was just he just wasn't mine. What does that mean in basketball terms? I, weird. You know, vibes. I don't know, <laughs> but I loved that Magic team. So I I don't know. Mm. Like I really liked that Dwight Howard back in the day. Um. I wanted that team to obviously beat the Lakers. Um, they just couldn't get it done. Um, my number four. I'm just I'm I'm here. And you know, 
he could maybe jump one more spot. But this is my most current player, Nikola Jokic. I, I every time I'm I watch him, on, I I didn't think to put him on my honorable. He's on my honorable yeah. list. Yeah. I, at first, I thought, oh, he's going to be on my honorable list. And then as I started looking, I'm like, he's immediately jumping up. He's become one of my favorite current players just to watch. The things that he does on the court are just short of incredible. His vision is insane. The way he gets off his shots sometimes are insane. He does these weird, one-footed, ugly-looking, yeah. high-release shots that are like a mixture of all these other international players. And he's one of the un most unathletic guys out there. It's perfect. I love it. Because it looks like he shouldn't be out there. But he's so good. He is the, the definition of, like, just getting beat up by your dad when you're younger <laughs> playing basketball. Where he's just pulling out all the stops. He's doing the up, the un up and unders and stuff like that. Like, I, I don't get it. He just doesn't look like he should be doing what he does, and he does. And that's what I think is so enticing to me. Um, his footwork is actually incredible. Um, what he does in the post. Yeah. His his shooting touch, is it, it doesn't make sense. He has the softest yeah. shot of all time, I think. Because when he goes for, like, baby hooks and things, if it hits the rim, it just, like, rolls over. Yeah. It doesn't even bounce off the rim, barely at all. Um it's just it's fun to watch, and I'm glad that he got a championship already, and I hope that he can make it back again because, I don't know, it's just it's so interesting to me. As a guy that, you know, most of the time you're looking for guys that are jumping out of the gym, dunking on people, um, shooting crazy deep threes or things like that. Like, he just plays the game. And, again, the best part, he doesn't really care. Like, I'm, I know he cares. But at the same time, he also, like, has this balance of, like, he wants to go home in the offseason. Like, he likes his breaks from work. I For some reason, I like that just straightforwardness with him. Um, and that's why he's jumped all the way to number four on my list. Nice. So, yeah. All right, we got to speed up. Sorry. Uh, my number three. Lakers Pau Gasol is my number three. I figured. I figured. This was the short era of when I was a Lakers fan. Kobe became my guy around like 06. Mm -hmm. And that's when the Lakers started making trades to try to get back on track. And they traded for Pau Gasol, got him from Memphis. And he was the perfect number two for Kobe. Mm -hmm. They spoke Italian to each other on the bench and on the court. Yeah, They knew how to work off of each other perfectly in the triangle and in the pick and roll. Mm -hmm. Pau... He took his game, even though he averaged like better numbers in Memphis, maybe. He took his game to another level in LA yeah. because it translated to championship basketball. Right. And the Lakers won two titles with him in the late 2000s going into the 2010s. Mm -hmm. he, he was just the perfect guy next to Kobe. Yeah. And I loved watching their dynamic and how they played in that era. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, I. That's when he lost me is when he went to the Lakers, but he was. <laughs> Obviously a great player, one of the greatest. Um, and I like that he's he's still involved with the Bryant family. I think that's really cool. Um, so, yeah. All right, my number three. Another pretty easy one to uh, surmise, if if you know me at all. Love the guys that are shooters, and this is one of the best shooters of when I was a child. Again, that he would be like a stretch four nowadays. He played the three most of the time back on a team that, I didn't really like this team, but I liked some of their select players. Another team that could never get over the hump in the early 2000s, the Sacramento Kings. Talking about Peja Stojakovic. My number two is Peja Stojakovic. Thank <laughs> Let's you. Let's talk about him. Okay. I mean, yes, he could just, again, it, the weird part too, he's another one of those players. He was never the guy for his teams. He was like the third guy for the Kings. But – he would always come up in big moments and have he, he could have huge games, go off for crazy numbers. And even though he wasn't the main guy, he averaged anywhere from like 16 to 22 points a game. And for his career, I think. He finished third in MVP voting in 2004, I believe. Yeah. Which is insane. Yeah. And it wasn't always, you know, it wasn't just his shooting. Um, but at the time, he was a volume shooter for the early 2000s. And that's, yeah. I mean, everybody's breaking those records nowadays. But 
he was what you would call a volume shooter back then. And not too many guys were taking the three as he was. And again, it wasn't just his three point game. He could, you know, go off the dribble and things like that. But as he aged, because he was a shooter, he was able to prolong his career because he became just kind of a shooter as he aged. But I'll let you talk about him a little bit since he's number two on yours. This guy is a big part of my childhood, Joey. Yeah. So when my cousin used to play NBA Live, mm-hmm. his favorite team that he'd always do franchises with was the Sacramento Kings. <laughs> and because they, of that. I mean, they were a fun team in those games. I got to know Mike Bibby and Peja and Vladi very well yeah. and, and all those guys. Mm-hmm. And just figuring out like that he was the three-point champion and seeing his re- how unique his release is and how yeah. quick it was and how unstoppable he was in NBA Live because yeah. of how high his three-point rating was. Mm-hmm. It it all just like came together for this like I I don't know I don't know how to describe it it was mm-hmm. it was just like a special kind of player as a child yeah to like come to learn about mm-hmm. and I I just I he's a he has a special place in my heart Peja Stoyakovic yeah because of the era and, and, and like I said the video games mm-hmm. all of it coming together Peja just meant a lot yeah it is a it is a big part of my nostalgia as well yeah. Um, and that's why I hope that, you know, his son, Andre can, you know, do something. Um, I'd like to, I'm, I'm glad that he's in college and he's, you know, evolving his game, but I'm hoping that, you know, he can continue because I would love to have another Stoyakovich in the league. That would be cool. Um, all right. Um, so what, okay. So that was, who was your number three? My number three was pal. Okay. Your number three was was Peja. My My number two was Peja. So it's your number two. Um, well, let's just – well, now this works because now I can go back to my number one, and then I'll cut back to my number two. Okay. My number one is Dirk Nowitzki. No surprises there if anybody knows me at all. He's been one of my favorite players. I've listed him as, like, my second play, second favorite player of all time, multiple times. He's right around the top three always. Um, you basically already hit the nail on the head, but as a kid when I was growing up and – the way that he shot threes as a big man, I had never seen before. And it was like my first introduction into it. And as a kid, again, I loved shooting the three ball and things like that. And I kind of started learning turnaround fadeaways from him. And like I would imitate his game. Now, I wasn't seven foot up, obviously. <laughs> but um, just the way that he played and he was so smooth, his footwork was incredible. Um, it's one of my, the things that I always say was underrated about my game growing up is like, I could post up because my dad would show me like things and he would say, watch Dirk Nowitzki, like the way that he moves at his size and things like that was just incredible. The way he kept the ball away from defenders, it was just crazy. And then he had, you know, on top of that, he just had a really good career, multiple, multiple time, all-star NBA finals, MVP champion like everything you could want the biggest thing too we watched an episode of um what was that show called what is it called pranked with ashton kutcher what was that one called it was called punk punk yeah <laughs> Jeez. um there was an episode where dirk Nowitzki was on punk and he was at a really nice restaurant i don't know if he was with a girlfriend or fiance at the time or whatever and they had some person come up to him with a whole bag, like a Santa Claus bag, of just, like, random stuff. Hockey sticks, just footballs, and had him sign them. And he signed almost every single one without hesitation. He was a little bit confused, but he signed them all. And so just to see that, like, he is a good guy on top of that, outside of the game, adds a little value to it. And as a kid, I was like, oh, that's really cool. So he's my number one for sure. All right, what's your number one? And then I'll go back to my number two because we might be on the same page. Uh, I don't think we are. <laughs> okay, I don't then. think we are. Okay, then. That's cool. My number one is another Argentinian. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who You're was right. on that 04 team. You're right. In retrospect, it's crazy how stacked that team was. Yeah, it is. But they he, had Andres Nocioni too, right? I think so. Yeah. But this guy was the star of that team. Yeah. He came into his own in the early 2000s. He was part of the reason why the like first time I cried over sports when the Pistons lost in 05. But over time, as I became 
as I came to appreciate basketball more, and I went and looked back at what Manu was and what he did. Manu Ginobili, he's he's my favorite international player of all time. Yeah, he might be the only player in Spurs history in that Popovich era mm-hmm. that got complete freedom when he went into the game. Yeah, and I guarantee there were fights and arguments over and over again because of that. Because Pop doesn't allow that. Yeah. <laughs> like, even Tim Duncan stuck to what he did. Mm-hmm. Tony Parker got some freedom but had to stick to the offense. Yeah. When Manu came in, he knew the offense. But Pop knew, to get the best out of this guy, I have to let him run wild a little bit. Mm-hmm. He is the reason why the Euro step has become what it, what it is. Yeah. He brought that in. He was extremely athletic. He was super quick. His IQ was through the roof. He can make all types of crazy passes within that system. Mm -hmm. He was an all-star level player that only made one all-star team because Mm -hmm. Pop made him be a sixth man. Yeah. And the one season he started, he he was an all-star. Right. But Pop kept him in that system because he knew bringing Manu off the bench with the second unit. Yeah. He was the superstar of the second unit. Yeah. And most I think most players of his caliber wouldn't have been able to like lower their ego yeah. to take that on. And they won five championships because of it. Mm-hmm. You got Tim and Tony in the starting lineup, and then you got one of the most versatile international players of all time coming off the bench mm-hmm. to just do everything. And he was a walking highlight reel. I think in most other situations in the league, he averages damn near like 26, 25 or 26 a game Mm -hmm. and just shows off all of his ability. Yeah. But he had to show it off all in the constraints of San Antonio. And he did it for how many years did he play? He played from 2001. Yeah. To like 2018. Mm -hmm. He was the last of the big three left. Yep. Until his last day, he still was doing crazy stuff. So I yeah, I have a high level of appreciation for Manu Ginobili. He was was he just after David Robinson then? I think I think he came in around he was on the O two team that won the championship. Yeah. He wasn't like a major part of that O two team, but he was on that team. Yeah, because I was gonna say So yeah, I think he got picked in O one. Yeah. So I'm just trying to think of like there's guys that he could have played with. Maybe Sean Elliott was still on that team. I don't know. I can't remember. But he could have played was with Was it Manu first, then Tony? Because I don't think they were in the same draft. Right. Because he could have. It might have been Manu 2000 and then Tony 2001. Yeah. That might have been what it was. Because I'm just thinking, like, he could have played with one of those guys and then also played with Kawhi Leonard. Just wild <laughs> to think about. That's a good pick. I don't like him personally, but that's just a whole other story. It's blasphemous, Joey. All right. So, my pseudo number one outside of Dirk, I can't believe he wasn't on your list at all. Um, but. Maybe you just forgot about him. Yi Jian Li- No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm mad at myself but, because I, I just that made me remind that reminded me of one of my favorite international players, and I'm sick now. I this happens at the end of all of my lists. I forget something. <laughs> number two. This is <laughs> in relation to you, I Yi Jian Leon. I defend this guy to the ends of the earth to so many basketball people. Yao Ming. Because he was great. <laughs> Yao Ming Yao was incredible. Was to this day he's the only person that big that was that good. Yeah, to this seven day. foot six with good post moves. Me- but better than good, he had like all time footwork. Yeah, <laughs> and touch. He shook Shaq out of his shoes at yeah. times. To this day, Yao Ming is the only person that I feel like Shaq ever gives credit to. Shaq usually is like, "Oh, they were good, but you know, I could have done better." Yao Ming, he consistently Listen, gives his dues. It was Shaq and Yao in that era, and then there was a long dot, dot, dot until you yeah. got to the next one. It was those two at the top. Yeah. Yao Ming is definitely up there with guys like Grant Hill of what could have been if his career was not derailed by injuries. His size, it, it was going to happen that way no matter what. Yeah. He, and played, luckily, eight, he played eight years. Something like that. It was like 02 to, 0 to 2010, I believe. Yeah, something like it was that. Like, yeah, it was like 02 Because there were some good – Rockets runs when they had Tracy McGrady, Yao Ming. That their farthest run was with, without T Mac, which is the craziest part. Yeah. But they had some really good teams, some fun teams actually. Shout out Francisco Garcia. Shouts um, out Francisco Garcia. Um, yes, but Yao Ming at the time was just incredible to watch. 
him versus Shaq was just prime time. Um, and again, the thing about it being seven foot six at that time, you would have thought, oh, he can't move at all. And again, he could move like crazy. But he also had a really—he wasn't heavy when he first came in the league. No, but he had a really <laughs> he, good yeah. mid-range shot. He shot over eighty percent from the free throw line. <laughs> yeah, at seven six. Like I think if if he played in today's era, he'd be shooting threes. He he most definitely would. What it's what Zach Eady is going to try to do when he comes in. Yeah, and again, speaking of Jokic's touch, Yao Ming had crazy touch around the rim. Again, for being a guy that big, yeah. It watching him was just incredible. One of the first guys that you watch, and he just. Stands there and dunks. Crazy. Just go look up pictures of him next to Shaq. It's hilarious. It's, yeah, it's incredible. But Yao yeah. Ming. Yao Ming, his first two years in the league, I, people need to watch those highlights because he was running the floor. Yeah. Like, he would take a dribble from the free throw line. Like, I, there's a clip of him, like, drop-stepping and dunking on uh, Ben Wallace opposite ways. Mm-hmm. Like, he had a mean streak. Yeah. And – if you've never watched, there was a Yao Ming documentary that I've watched like five, six <laughs> times. It came out in the 2000s, I think. But it shows like his first, his first, I believe, his rookie year in the league. Yeah. And documents everything like he went through. Mm-hmm. But he started out like timid and shy. Yeah. And Steve Francis and um, Katino Mobley, they had to like bring out of him that other side. And, man, he started dunking on people, and he yeah. would start shouting. Yeah. I was going to say, he started trash talking. That's one of the things Shaq yeah. always says, is that he, he started to trash talk him eventually, which was was hilarious. They're and again, friends, They're friends to this day. Right. And, again, Yao Ming has become one of the biggest international advocates advocates yeah. of basketball. He has a whole he's organization. He's pretty much Chinese royalty at this point. Yeah. yeah. There's, he's created a whole, like, organization to be able to expand the game globally which is wild yeah. and awesome so Yao Ming again I can't believe you left him off the list but the, the, that's what's gonna happen with every list I forget something uh, that's what's gonna happen yeah. kids today don't know Yao Ming in actuality he's like two or three on my list because yeah. Yao Ming means a lot yeah to me in terms of big men again goes to the nostalgia factor of a lot of these guys at the top are in these early 2000s era of our wheelhouse yeah. Also, right. one of the best jerseys in NBA history. Rookie year, Yao Ming, those Rockets the jerseys. Pinstripes. With, yeah, the pinstripes. I love, man, one yeah. of the best. Kind of the, the pseudo throwbacks. Yeah, I agree. All right, we went over time, which is fine. Top tens are good. They're fun. Um, next week, maybe the finals will be over. Maybe we're still going. We'll discuss it. Um, probably come back with another top ten list. Maybe give some news and notes. Maybe we'll go into the Tigers a little bit. Just give a little bit of some updates uh, if they get closer. And um, we'll go from there. But uh, this was a fun episode. And uh, this has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next time. Shouts out to Alper and Shingoon, too young to make the list. And shouts out to Coaches Papa Nikolaou. My guy for the Rockets. Wang, Elite name. Wang Zizi. My guy. Elite.